Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. A Friday DMZ. I know these, you like the Friday DMZs. You you were less anxious that late breaking news is going to thwart us, and and late breaking news came in lit, mere seconds before we got on the line with uh with uh, the news that Acosta, the labor secretary, is stepping down. Yeah, what are you going to do? There's no good time in the Trump era to to do a DMZ uh, <laughs> if your goal is is to not have late breaking news. So, but this is a story that obviously has been going on now for a couple of weeks. It's just the uh, maybe, well, probably not the denouement, but for Acosta, perhaps it is. Now, um, we were talking a little bit before. You know, uh, it's it's per- somewhat perplexing to me that he would step down because you know Trump's a fighter. He likes fighters. Doesn't like apologizing. Plenty of people who have done terrible things are still you know in his stead. Uh, he he did the requisite you know, no apology press conference in the in the Trump way, um, yeah. but uh, as Politico reported a few days ago, the still acting chief of staff Mick Mulvaney was angling to get Acosta out, not so much because of the Epstein uh, plea deal, but because he felt Acosta wasn't being aggressive enough in undoing. Obama era labor regulations. And, and you know, the, the flip side of that is there are some moderate Democrats like Joe Manchin who were resisting calls for him to resign. And there's some people on the left saying, Oh God, these moderate Democrats, what's wrong with them? They think they're going to win votes by, you know, giving Trump cover on Acosta. And it may have been that they were like, you know what? The next labor secretary is probably going to be worse. So why not keep this <laughs> guy be. around who's not you know, ripping up everything root and branch? That could be part of it. Um, you never know. And sometimes when people get pushed out or when people are vulnerable, the vultures come in and people have different reasons for pushing them out. I will say, look, as much as Trump is a fighter and he doesn't like to quit, uh, a lot of times that applies to himself. <laughs> not to throwing other people under the bus. True. He has gotten rid of plenty of people. Scott Pruitt comes to mind as an example. And and sometimes it's when they don't do a good job of defending themselves, at least in Trump's eyes, or when they get too much attention, when they um you know bother uh bother Trump. So in the case of Pruitt, some people think it was his angling to become the next like secretary of state or something ridiculous like that that actually did him in i think he had a bad fox news interview as well i think that was pruitt yeah anyway my wife who has an uncanny knack at at predicting things like this and knows acosta a little bit but she told me a few days ago she thought acosta would be out and this was based on the fact that she was uh hanging out at the capitol hill club in dc where the TVs all day were on Fox News. And she thought that the coverage from Fox News suggested that he was in trouble and that he wouldn't make it. This is before he held that, I guess it was like a press conference where he tried to explain what happened in in Florida uh, during his time there. Uh, Apparently that wasn't enough. And I I mean, I I can't know, of course, I don't want to be overly conspiratorial, um, but to what extent is the sentiment amongst Mulvaney and other conservatives uh, that Acosta wasn't diehard enough, how does that influence Fox News coverage? I mean, we, we do know that Fox News and Republicans have dialogue. <laughs> there, there is documentation of that. Um, the, line, the, the, the line between government and media is very blurred there. Um, so you could potentially see some of that sure. seeping in in people's um, uh, editorial decisions. The other thing, though, is just simply that Donald Trump is tied to the Epstein story. Um, And it doesn't mean he's implicated in the crimes of Epstein, but he's tied into the story. And certainly Donald Trump has his own problems in terms of Me Too problems. And so it may well be that there's only room and you can't get rid of Trump. There's only room enough for one guy who basically is battling against the zeitgeist. And so you throw the other guy, Acosta, under the bus. Uh could, could well be it. Um, and now I guess we'll get to <clears throat> see who comes next. I mean, they before Acosta, there was, you know, a Puzner who had uh, domestic violence accu- accusations thrown at him, and that helped derail his um, uh, nomination. So to me, Labor Secretary is not the hardest job to fill, but um, they seem to have a difficulty finding someone with a perfectly clean slate. 
Yeah, and I, I think this this speaks to people who have been like prosecutors in the past. Maybe um, maybe Kamala Harris may end up facing something like this. A lot of times you end up doing like plea bargaining deals that look really bad in hindsight. And I don't I don't really know enough about the case to say whether Acosta's version of the truth uh, has any resonance, which was essentially like, look, we wanted to get Epstein. Uh, we, we got him to register as a sex offender. We got him to do jail time. It wasn't my call to let him basically like out on work release during the day. <clears throat> but we wanted to get him on something. We weren't sure if we could get the women to all come forward. That's what Acosta says. And we didn't, and also Acosta said we didn't know about some of these other things that, that, that came forward later. Um, there's a version of this where Acosta is maybe not a hero, but at least, you know, acting appropriately. And then there's a version of this where no, the, the game is rigged. This is a powerful guy who got away with some horrific stuff. And Acosta basically gave him a sweetheart deal. I don't think we know which of those versions is true, but I do think that 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 having been someone who was like a district attorney or a prosecutor is a kind of a perilous job in terms of your political future. Yeah, I I, I 100% agree with that. Um, and you know, particularly att- attorney general, attorney general is often seen as a stepping stone kind of a job. Uh, it's, it's a statewide elected office. It, it, it can be a uh, a, a step before being governor or being senator, as it was for for Kamala. Yeah, a lot uh, of states' attorney general is way more powerful than the lieutenant governor, yeah. and more of a stepping stone to the governorship. Than but, the lieutenant. but I agree with you. I think a very fraught stepping stone. When you're attorney general, you have your finger in so many cases, so many controversies, and you do one thing wrong, you get on the wrong side of one case, that could get you know dredged up. And use as a as a sledgehammer to ruin your career. So as we you know, possibly pivoted to talk about the Democrats, uh, Kamala is definitely on the rise. You know, she certainly did herself well in the debate, um, but still kind of hanging out there is all of the potential political targets from her time as DA and AG. I mean, one of the reasons why you can't you know, there, there there's an argument that once. Once uh, there's blood in the water on Biden, that his African American support will collapse and shift to Kamala. You know, as in once once African Americans saw that Hillary Clinton was not a sure thing and Barack Obama was viable, there was a massive shift in his direction. Yeah. And you know, maybe that will be. I'm not making flat predictions, but we have anecdotal evidence that particularly among younger African Americans, there is deeper hesitancy towards Kamala because she is seen as uh, too conservative on criminal justice issues in her past. Uh, And so even if she, she might well win the majority of African American votes and then maybe that'll be sufficient for her to win the nomination, but there's still a a chunk that seems to be resisting jumping on yeah. that bad wagon in part for that reason. What do you think of the, so I guess the, the, the meme is uh, Kamala is a cop or Kamala right. the cop right. or whatever. Is that clever? Does that have resonance? Is, what's your take, I guess, on that being used as a brand against Well, her? I think, I mean, I, others have made this point, you, you know, Cops are, in most people's minds, uh, a good thing. You know, p- police in general have positive uh, approval, uh, and there are plenty. As I've mentioned this podcast and in other articles, the Democratic electorate's more mod than people recognize. Uh, it's older than people recognize. Uh, so, in terms of the Democratic primary writ large, that attack I don't think is a candidacy killer. But we're in a fractured race it's looking more and more like a four-way race you know maybe if, if you want to just look at the money a five-way yeah. race including Buttigieg but when this is that the latest NBC poll shows that if, if you believe that poll and, and who knows is it is it NBC Wall Street Journal I think they do it that was, that was yesterday right so um that very much shows a four-way race well I, I, it's every poll every post-debate poll is not in order, uh, Biden, Sanders, Kamala, Warren, 
they're the only four in double digits, and everyone else is five and below. And uh, this latest NBC one, Elizabeth Warren, surprisingly, well, in my I mean, that, There is definitely variance in the post-debate polling with the placement of two, three, and four. Uh, so the NBC Wall Street Journal was Warren's best poll of everything post-debate, where she was at 19, and Bernie and Kamala were at 13. But there are other polls where Kamala's second, other polls where Bernie is second, uh, and in the real clear politics average, they're all they're they're it's practically a, a three way tie for second place around fifteen percent. So I don't think we know exactly who's got the hot hand. Uh, yeah. And all the polling, well, one thing that the, the NBC Wall Street Journal poll suggested was that Biden was really holding on to the lion's share of his African American support. It was still in the in the upper forties. Other polling. He did worse, uh, and Kamala did did better. So that's a little fluid, um, but I think at minimum, it's fair to say that it's not an instantaneous uh, dominance by Kamala. I mean, Biden is still leading all the polling with African Americans, just by a much smaller amount yeah. than before the debate. Uh, and the well, I think the, I think the question is. Um, so, so what happened in that first debate is not a knockout. Of, clearly, clearly Biden was not, was not knocked out. Correct. So the question is, is it just a bad night? Can he get his act back together? Or was that indicative of what he can do and what is to come? And you know, you know, the big wild card is his second debate performance. You know, I, yes. I, I argued before that this I, you obviously can't take out the, the racial component to all this. But I think the bigger driver to his decline was a weak performance. He did not seem sharp at the debate. When Kamala came in with with the roundhouse punch, he didn't parry well. Uh, he, I would argue, um, that he has performed better since then. He, he now maybe it's because he's using he's using the teleprompter at his speeches. Uh, but yeah, it, well, he, gave, he gave a foreign policy speech yesterday. Right. I thought he gave two two good speeches: yeah. uh, the foreign policy speech and the the quasi apology speech in South Carolina, which was a broader defense of his overall record and a defense of his pragmatic record, um, which I think did him well. Uh, the foreign and, policy speech I like because he's basically setting himself up as the president, yeah. or as the he's attacking Donald Trump. He's not really focused on the other Democrats. And I just think subconsciously, yesterday at least, Biden looked like the heir apparent, uh, the standard bearer of the Democratic Party, going after Trump on an issue. And by the way, Biden getting to the right of Donald Trump, I would say, in terms of uh, foreign policy and national security. In in certain respects, yes. I mean, uh, not hard right, of course, but certainly more, uh, you know, harder on North Korea, harder on Putin. Yeah. Talking more openly about well, military force. It's so hard force. to say what the right is, what the right. Yeah, I mean, by the tr- Trump, scra- <laughs> Trump scrambles those lines. Uh, so I, so those two speeches and the CNN interview we gave with Chris Cuomo, which was a long interview, that CNN repeated a lot. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not a big cable TV watcher. Uh, I feel like every time I was checking in, it was it, there was a snippet of it always on. Um, and I thought he he seemed crisper, he seemed confident, he was you know leaning in and. And maybe this is uh, somewhat dicey on his part, you know, taking some shots at AOC and shots at single payer. Um, he, yeah. he, he was he was more aggressively carving out his space as the moderate pragma, pragmatic candidate, uh, which w- is in line with the South Carolina speech that he gave in the foreign policy speech. So uh, you know, that potentially limits his growth. Um, because he can't as easily be the unifying candidate. Right. But is he holding on to the moderate wing of the party? And, and, you know, some people thought it, once you drew blood on Biden, he would just collapse, that it was all name ID. And once you saw he was weak, boom, it would just go away. It seems like because he has a dip, but it is, it has not gone through the floor that maybe he is holding on to a more loyal and more fervent moderate base. Right. Uh, and, and you have to wonder how much of this that you could take. I mean, look, I know it's different because there are going to be like 20 debates probably. And, mm-hmm. and in a general election, there's usually three. Who knows if Trump will debate at all? Mm-hmm. Probably. But 
But a lot of times, you know, Reagan had that horrible first debate against Mondale, bounces back. The second debate, expectations are lower, exceeds expectations. It's great. Barack Obama had a bad debate against Mitt Romney. Back. Presidential incumbents often have bad first debates because the target's on their back. The expectations are high. Uh, and the challenger f- feels a little loose, a looser, uh, ability to kind of swing, you know, go for that jugular. Uh, and this is sort of akin to that. And Biden was the unquestionable front runner and someone who had been lagging, you know, took an opportunity to take a big swing. Now, in the next debate, Biden's not the unquestionable front runner. Uh, you know, you have this really complicated four-way dynamic where you have two candidates in in Sanders and Warren who are championing the populist left and you have two candidates Biden more squarely in the pragmatist camp and Kamala kind of straddling the two camps and you have this identity element where you have two old white men and two women one of whom is 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 a person of color uh and uh might be trying to play up that angle uh, to uh, dislodge, to try to consolidate the notion that someone who is not uh, of a traditional demographic should be uh, the nominee. So uh, not everybody is going to have their target on Biden's back now because he's already been dinged. Uh, I don't know who shoots at who, quite frankly, or if they all try to stand down because there's risk in going negative. There's risk in... Don't you w- I mean, look, don't you wish we could have five people in this next debate? Instead of, I wish it be four. I, I mean, I feel like, you know, Sanders, Warren, Kamala, Biden cover a lot of ground, cover all the ideological ground of the party, and cover a lot of the demographic ground. Uh, you would have a very robust debate over the future of the party. I throw, just I, those I four. throw a Buddha judge. You, I probably you throw could. Buddha you judge certainly could. Uh, but, but I. That's I, it. I mean, Buttigieg is not going to go away because he he raked in all this money early based on a couple of nice performances, but demographically where he goes from here, how does he get, break out of his very narrow college white educated white white college educated lane very hard to see but if he has staff and he can do tv ads why quit you know maybe, maybe you'll get your moment and 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 you know and crack into the top tier again well hey you you since you invoked aoc a few minutes ago yes uh i have to ask you about yes. this this brewing controversy where um the squad <laughs> as the Washington Post, I think they've they've um, coined that term with uh, AOC and her gal pals, um, where AOC has implied that Nancy Pelosi is racist. I guess implied that that Pelosi is going out of her way to pick fights with these freshmen women of color. That's heavy stuff. How do you? What well, just, just this she tried to walk that. She was asked point blank, "Are you saying Pelosi is a racist?" She said, "Absolutely not." But I well, agree. that's like when Kamala Harris says to Joe Biden, "I'm not trying to call you a racist." Fair, fair, but. fair. <laughs> uh, and you had one African American member of Congress, Lacey Clay, who has been a target for the Justice Democrats in 2018 and 2020. Um, someone who they see as is insufficiently progressive. He. Um, berated AOC um, for playing the race card and saying that uh, that it was juvenile uh, and like they didn't know their history. Um, but th- this is, I think, in part tied to AOC's chief of staff uh, tweeting that the the blue dogs and the new Dems are like the new Southern Democrats who are trying to keep black and brown people down. And, you know, one of the leaders of the New Democrats is African-American and is from the Deep South. And she was very uh, uh, displeased uh, by that, that that characterization. So, you know, so there's a lot of tension that's 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 spilling out uh, inside the House Democratic Caucus. Uh, although you could argue from, you know, as Pelosi saying, you know, these are essentially four votes. They are not representative of the lion's share of the caucus. They did it. They weren't able to whip a lot of votes when it came down to the border bill that they're so upset about. Um, and, you know, some of the pushback from her defenders is, you know, she has this enormous social media following uh, and you shouldn't be, dis- you shouldn't be disrespectful of that. They, they represent more than just the four of themselves. Uh, and it just, it, 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 it com- comes down to just two totally different perspectives of what's the objective here. You know, Pelosi's trying to run the house. Pelosi's trying to govern. Uh, and, uh, AOC is trying to lead a movement, and the two the two goals are not well in sync. And I think 
you know, there, there, there's, there's some uh, befuddlement. Like, why is Pelosi being this harsh? Uh, you know, Pelosi sort of tries to say they, they started this fire. They're the ones going at us, and we're, uh, and I'm just trying to keep the house in order. Uh, but you could argue that she escalated this fight when she uh, talked trash to Marine Dowd. Uh, why would Pelosi do that? Uh, and I would speculate it's because she knows that AOC et al. are not trying to uh, play nice. That, that, that their fundamental objective is to attack Democrats who they see as insufficiently progressive. They want the purge. They want the moderates and the blue dogs out. Yeah. They are encouraging primary challenges. And so when they have bills like this border bill where Pelosi said, hey, we fought as hard as we could. This is the best we're going to get. People like AOC use those opportunities as ways to go to her social media following and say, this is what I'm talking about. This is what's wrong with Washington. We need to get rid of these people. Uh, this remi- and- it reminds me of Jim DeMint and Ted Cruz. I remember Jim DeMint said, oh, sure. "If we, I'd rather have 30, t- basically 30 Ted Cruz's in the Senate than 51. Right. Whatever, Charles but, Brassley's or But something. the difference is Mitch that McConnell's. Nancy Pelosi is not John Boehner and is not Paul Ryan. Uh, she, she is aggressively, uh, trying to put them in their place in a way that Boehner and the, and Ryan did not want to do with the Tea Party. Uh, and you could argue that, uh, this makes, uh, Pelosi short-sighted you know uh the tea party ran rampant and now donald trump is president (laughs) or you say this makes pelosi the adult in the room saying i'm not going to let this the democratic party and all of washington be steamrolled by the extreme left i wish that republicans had a nancy pelosi to have stopped what happened to the republican party or at least to have tried i would have liked to have seen what would have happened now, it's the whole dynamics different. The base is different. The media is different. Um, but I applaud her. I'm a fan, at least stylistically. <laughs> I dig the I dig the jacket and the sunglasses. <laughs> well, and I think you know, so far, I, I have no evidence that her polling has suffered. That Pelosi's polling has suffered by taking this tack. She so far has kept a firm iron grip on her caucus you know she uh not that she wins every fight you know again she 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 recognized she couldn't go that far with the senate on the border bill and so she accepted what was the available bill but she got her caucus to vote for that bill by and large uh now i've heard some folks on the left saying why isn't pelosi being this aggressive towards the moderates in her caucus they're they're the ones that sandbagged her on this border bill they're the ones that uh didn't want to plant their flag and push the issue uh, to get some of their planks in. Why do they get they get any guff? And uh, I would say one, they got a little bit of guff. She, she was an equal opportunity uh, corraller when it came to um, motions to recommit. You know, she has said to both the left and the middle, "Hey, these are partisan votes. The Republicans are trying to do mischievous things in these votes, and we just need to lock arms and not let them do that." And she's lost a few of those. She, there's a couple of those that she has lost. So it's not like Pelosi's batting a thousand. Um, but she has criticized both the left and the middle on those votes. But on something like this, I think Pelosi's mentality is, I'm trying to maintain my House majority. I know the moderates need to take some stances like this in order to be viable in their districts. So I want to give them that cover. And the folks on the left need to be adults, be mature and say, you know what, don't make their lives difficult in these situations. Um, let them have their latitude. Uh, and if you aren't going to let them do that, I'm going to come down like a ton of bricks. So they, so you aren't seen as the face of the party and me as the pragmatist Pelosi and they are more seen as the face of the party. Well, Bill, my latest piece at the Daily Beast is about the out, the ind- sort of outrage complex, the fact that we are inundated constantly with outrages. And if you're on the left, you get outraged. Uh, if you're on the right, you do. Some of it's legitimate. Some of it's kind of petty. But it could be little things. It could be, you know, Nike and Colin Kaepernick, or it could be this this guy uh, who went up to somebody wearing a MAGA hat at a barbecue joint in D.C., and basically called him a racist. There are all these 
microaggressions and then actual legitimate outrages that we are just barraged with constantly, 24-7 cable news and Twitter. You know, a, a generation ago, you might maybe read about some of this stuff in the paper, maybe saw a clip on the nightly news. Now we are inundated with this. And and one of the controversies, one of the part of this culture war uh, had to do with the, the women's soccer team uh, winning, I believe, the World Cup. I didn't watch it all, but yeah. Bill... Did you watch this? Were you engrossed by this? And and uh, you know what did you make of this of this I, I latest did, outrage? I didn't watch because because I don't really have my TV set up for it and didn't have the 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 free time. But um, I and, and I just don't like soccer. I don't like watching soccer. <laughs> um, See, you're I, you're just like me. <laughs> um, I just, it's not drill, it's not a, baby drill. It's not a, it's not a high scoring enough game for me. Um, <laughs> But I did see the clips of the the two goals that they scored, and I'm obviously very excited for the victory. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's it, like everything else becomes just another you know culture war point um, when you know Trump attacks uh, their stars for having the temerity to uh, criticize him and demand uh, equal pay. Um, so uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have too much to say more about. I mean, it's just, it's just one more culture war uh, example. Yeah. But to, to circle back to the Pelosi AOC thing for, for a bit, uh, I'm curious to see how that impacts the presidential race. You know, to what extent are these controversies going to come up in the next debate and have, I mean, you know, some folks like, uh, um, I, I think most of the candidates didn't vote on that border bill because they were at the debate. Uh, I'm not even sure if they made statements about whether they support it or not. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I, I, I know they weren't there for it. Um, to what extent are they going to be asked to take sides? You know, was this a good bill? Sure, there have been more provisions there. If, if you were there, what would you have, would you have voted for it? You know, do you do you defend what Nancy Pelosi is doing? You know, is she being responsible here, or is she needlessly provoking the left? You know, um, Bernie and. Warren and now Harris have all partnered with AOC on certain legislation. They're all angling for her endorsement, and AOC has been um, clearly antagonistic towards Biden. Like, no, Biden's not chasing that endorsement, and he, I mean, he, he criticized her uh, in that Cena interview. As she, she is, she is the Steve King or the Jeff Sessions right. of the Democratic Party's endorsement race. So um, uh, I, I think it's going to be. Um, it, AOC's stature in the party, I think, is in question. You know, how, to what extent does she hold the whip hand? What extent is her endorsement all that valuable? Um, you know, Biden has clearly made the decision that uh, he's better off uh, taking the other side of the case. Uh, and Harris, who I think is trying to uh, be left but not too left, uh thinks it is more value to be seen as uh, friendly with AOC. So does that run a risk for Harris and that she is probably the least likely to get that AOC endorsement? You know, Bernie and Warren are much more likely to get it based on their issue positions. Um, does she, um, you know, lose both ends of the argument? You know, she chased AOC, doesn't get her, and also doesn't get seen as the most politically pragmatic electable choice because she's kind of caught... Uh, in the middle, and if you think that um, it's crazy to be uh, against AOC because she's sort of the the darling of the left right now, this is just this is anec totally anecdotal. Um, when I, I, I was on a plane yesterday, and I was uh, next to a very chatty passenger who was um, uh, an old, old older woman. Uh, and she just started launching a political discussion with me just for no for, for no particular reason, uh, and not prompted by me. Said, you know, good for Pel she's a like, good for Pelosi. You know, she needs to tell those those people what for. Um, uh, and I've heard that actually from a couple other people in my in, in my circle. So uh, I, that's not to say that that is the dominant constituency, but only that there is a constituency, there is a Pelosi constituency that likes it when she does that. Um, and so if there's a three-way race for the AOC fans and a one-person race for the Pelosi fans, who comes up better in that equation? Possibly Biden. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting. I'm fascinated um, to see AOC's future just in general. Like, does she run against 
Gillibrand at some point uh, does AOC. Um, she's, you know, like the rest of us, she's going to get older and there are going to be maybe younger, more progressive members elected around the country that may steal some of her thunder. What, what happens to her? You know, where is she at a decade from now? I think it'll be very interesting to watch. Well, I mean, it's, I, I don't know how Catholic she's going to be about it. I mean, I think she's in, I assume a safe district. I mean, I, I can't totally discount the possibility of a primary challenge against her. I would, I would probably think she's less vulnerable to that than say Rashida Tlaib or Ilan Omar. I think they might have uh, a, a, be carrying on more risk in their particular districts. Um, but it's not, a, not out of the question that she might be yeah. making some enemies there. Uh, but probably she's in a safe place that she could occupy for her adult life. She could be in that seat for 40 years if she wanted to and be you know, be sort of like the birdie, be like the uh, pillar of the progressive Demo- democratic socialist movement for her life. Uh, and if she ran statewide, you know, New York State is not that uniformly left. You know, Andrew Cuomo beat Cynthia Nixon largely through uh, upstate and suburban votes. So uh, that's a that that's a riskier proposition for her. I mean, yeah. she might, it, it, she may conclude that based on demographic changes over time that maybe the moment's right for her to make a bigger step, but chances are she'd wonder, be better off staying where she is. I also wonder, I mean, and, and you see how Ted Cruz has become chastened over time, right? Remember when Ted Cruz first burst on the scene, he was going to set everybody straight, and now he's been put in his place mm-hmm. um, by virtue of, of trying to run for president, at least for now. Um, I wonder, like, is Pelosi on a mission? Like, is Pelosi going to try to make an example out of AOC and, like, basically, in that, you know, exact some sort of revenge? And, and, and uh, or is Pelosi just trying to survive and get ahead and ride off into the sunset? I don't think she wants to completely kneecap her. I think Pelosi is well aware that you need both flanks of the party, that the, the left flank is not going to dissipate. Um, but she wants to rein them in so they don't cause too many problems. Uh, uh, and, and that's why the DCCC is, you know, say, saying to vendors, don't you, you, you sign up with a primary challenger, you're cut off from DCCC work. Uh, and this drives the Justice Dem crowd nuts because this is their reason of being. Uh, they, they, they aren't satisfied with simply moving the Overton window. And having existing Democrats be 10 degrees more left than they were four years ago. You know, they want a clean house. Uh, and so they're actually, they're, you're starting to see a couple of consultancies crop up saying, we, uh, we are here for the challengers. Yeah. We are willing to be blackballed by DCCC and, and just be there for the challengers. And I'm curious to see if those folks can actually make a living doing that. Cause a lot of little consultants get by by doing you know, corporate work between elections. Yeah. This uh, is deja vu. We've seen this before on the Republican side. Yeah. So I, I so you think that as much as your sympathies with Pelosi, um, I mean, you're, you, you're, you are inclined to believe that, you know, the, the tail's always wagging the dog on both the right and the left. Um, do you think that, um, uh, the Democratic Party is becoming too woke for its own good, or is Pelosi doing her job and keeping them on the straight and narrow? Oh, they're going insane. The left is going insane. They're radical. They're all you have to do. Like, this should be about um, winning the presidency. Like, like how do you win Pennsylvania and Michigan and, and Wisconsin? And and they're trying to win San Francisco. That's no offense to Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Maybe they're trying to win Queens. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm rooting for Pelosi, and part of it is like, I don't, I don't think it's good to root for chaos. Like, I'm not one of these people who roots for the Democratic Party to go crazy, because you better be careful what you wish for, right? I think Claire McCaskill kind of set this bad example where she like tried to help Todd Akin win the nomination. Because she thought he would be easier to beat, that he was doing top. Like, and, she, and, it, and she was correct. <laughs> she was correct, but she bragged about it. She was transparent about it. And I think it set an example 
And yes, Democrats and the media, but I repeat myself, wanted Donald Trump to win the nomination to vanquish, to destroy the Republican Party. They didn't want to face like a Marco Rubio. It, but guess what? Be careful what you wish for. They got Trump and he became president. So similarly, I don't want to root for like, I don't want to root that like, the craziest, most radical person wins the Democratic nomination or that they have this, you know, radical uh, chaos and big fight because I just don't think it's healthy. And we should be careful, like especially once you are once you are on the ballot as the general election you know, nominee, all bets are off. And so um, I'm rooting for Pelosi because I think that she is like at least an institutionalist and at least somewhat pragmatic. I imagine you'd be rooting for Biden in the in the primary then because he would be the most akin to that in the presidential race. Even if you even if you wouldn't vote for him, you'd rather see a Biden be the nominee than the other three. Well, Bill, as you know, I'm I'm I've settled on uh, the Democratic nominee that I'm that I've endorsed is Andrew Yang. Yeah. <laughs> um, two, so per, two percent, the- two percent in the NBC Wall Street Journal poll. He's tied with Beto. That's right. That's right. So, but as you know, um, on the right, I've endorsed um, Justin Amash, and on, on the left, I've in, endorsed uh, Andrew Yang. Having said that, if you're going to limit me to the top tier, the four, um, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, I'd be more com- much more comfortable with a Joe Biden nominee than uh, certainly Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. Let me say this one thing. I, I have to run, uh, but, but allow me to have the last word in this uh, discussion. Um, I think be- as it uh, winnows down to what's looking like a four-way race, pending someone you know having their moment in a, su- a subsequent debate, um, I think you're going to get a lot of chaos. I, I think that that is a very messy, complicated four-way race because it involves fault lines on ideology, race, and gender. Um, so. It, it already got messy very much earlier than past Democratic primaries. But Democratic primaries often have uh, fraught moments to them, but they tend to happen later. You know, if you're in a really tight four-way race with lots of incentive um, uh, to be aggressive and be aggressive on subject matters that are uh, highly polarizing, uh, you're going to have a lot of hurt feelings over the course of it. Now, that doesn't mean they, they can't unify when it's all over. You know, Obama and Clinton, you know, put down their their swords after 2008. Uh, but you certainly can't guarantee it. Uh, and it's happening alongside the Pelosi AOC uh, friction. So um, we're we're I think it's fairly uh, certain that there is going to be an element of chaos over the next several months. Um, I don't think. It is correct to say, therefore, it is a certainty they will continue to be in a state of chaos for the general election. They could snap to and say, let's fight the common enemy. But it certainly is possible they remain disunified, uh, which and and Trump is someone who's going to want to stoke that disunity, meddle in the primary, encourage that, that kind of uh, factionalism so he'll have a better shot at winning a plurality or even a win with a popular vote minority as he did in 2016. All right, Bill Sher, you get the last word. Uh, Um, Anything to plug before we sign off? Check out that latest piece I wrote at the Daily Beast, uh, which is about all the outrage that we must fend off on a daily basis thanks to 24-7 cable news and Twitter and the technological shifts that we have endured in the last decade or so. Also, um, I do want to plug, uh, for those of you who are fans of the podcast, um, and as you know, Bill, I've pivoted to video, and I've got some great video podcasts coming out soon. Already in the can, I talked to Ben Howe of RedState.com. We rehashed this 2013 epic feud that he and I uh, were involved in. I talked to Jen Saki, formerly of the Obama administration, um, and T.K. Coleman of a group called Praxis that does mentoring and apprenticeship programs and lots of cool stuff. Check out the podcast on YouTube and iTunes at Matt Lewis and the News. All right. And um, check out my last Real Clear Politics column, which is about 
uh, the danger Democrats have taken in embracing certain controversial positions on immigration uh, when they could be sticking to comprehensive immigration reform, which polls much, much better than some of the more narrow stances they have taken in the past uh, couple weeks. So that's over at Real Clear Politics. And uh, I will talk to you uh, next week. All right, Bill Scherer and everybody, have a good one.